This program is presented by Birch Gold Group, the precious metal IRA specialists. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. And I'm Evelyn Lee. Good morning. Today's January 16th. Thanks for starting this week with, with us. Unfortunately, though, we do not have good news to kick off this Monday. All 72 people are dead after a plane crashed in Nepal yesterday. The, the flight from capital Kathmandu went down shortly before landing. NTD's Costa Menes has more on the story, but we should warn you, there is some graphic footage. Take a look. Sunday's plane crash is the worst to occur in Nepal in three decades. The Yeti Airlines plane crashed into a river gorge just before landing at the newly built airport of Pokhara, around 80 miles from the capital Kathmandu. The plane was on a short flight from Kathmandu which lasted less than half an hour. The aviation authority said the aircraft last made contact with the airport shortly before 11 a.m. local time on Sunday. Local authorities say the passengers included 37 men, 25 women, 3 children and 3 infants. The plane was also carrying international passengers, including 5 Indians, 4 Russians, 1 Irish, 2 South Koreans, 1 Australian, 1 French and 1 Argentine national. The plane's black box was recovered Monday morning. A local resident managed to capture footage of the plane crash. Video footage from inside the plane recovered at the crash site shows the exact moment of the crash. The tragedy was the third deadliest crash in the Himalayan nation's history, data shows. Deadly air incidents are common in Nepal, with many small airports in mountainous terrain and volatile weather conditions. Yesterday's crash occurred in clear weather. The European Union has banned Nepali airlines from its airspace since 2013, citing safety concerns. Nepal's Prime Minister said he was deeply saddened by the tragic incident. He added that he'd be calling an emergency cabinet meeting with an ongoing investigation into the cause. Cost MNS, NTD News. California continued to be pummeled by storms over the weekend. At least 19 people have died as a result of the weather. Floods, mudslides and power outages are just some of the problems residents are facing. Now the White House is answering the state's call for support. President Joe Biden approved an emergency declaration for California on Saturday. It came as another wave of rainstorms began to drench the waterlogged state at the weekend. And after State Governor Gavin Newsom made a public call earlier in the day for the president to make a move. Because that's my response to the folks out there on cots right now in terms of what are we going to do for them. A series of atmospheric rivers has pounded California since December 26. The weather event involving a flowing column of condensed water vapor is rarely seen in such frequent succession. They've left at least 19 people dead and brought floods, mudslides, power outages, home evacuations and road closures. Biden ordered federal aid for state, tribal and local recovery efforts in the affected areas, according to a White House statement. At the earlier briefing in the central city of Merced, Newsom urged Californians to remain vigilant over the next two days, saying he was aware many people are fatigued about the ongoing challenges. 
As rain, snow and gusts swept into the state yet again on Saturday, residents in this Santa Cruz County community of Felton said they were indeed fatigued. The cleanup was awful, but, you know, we cleaned it up. And then next thing you know, fast forward, like, what, six days was it? I don't know. Uh, we're flooding again. So we were in shock because even though we prepped for it, we didn't prep for it to get as high as it had. And so that was even more mess and more destruction. You know, our furnace is gone. You know, it's just a lot. And then to go through the third time, it's just defeating. Uh, three floods in, in 10 days or a week is it's a bit too much. It's, uh, it's tough. Uh, but, you know, life, life goes on. The ninth and final atmospheric river of the series is due to make landfall on Monday and last a couple of days. We're going over to China. The country has released new figures on COVID-related deaths. They say now close to 60,000 people have died in hospitals since the end of the zero COVID policy. That policy was dismantled in early December. But many experts are skeptical of the country's official data. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more on the COVID situation in China. China's official numbers are a big increase over their previously reported figures. But many experts are criticizing the country's lack of transparency around the pandemic and think the numbers have been widely understated. The World Health Organization says China heavily underreports COVID deaths. Authorities there had been reporting five or fewer deaths a day over the past month. China previously claimed to have one of the lowest death rates in the world, with just over 5,000 deaths since the pandemic began. These figures are inconsistent with the long lines, seen at funeral homes and body bags seen leaving crowded hospitals. It's also a stark contrast to the U.S., where the numbers are 800 times higher. China recently changed the way it records COVID-related deaths to include only those that die from respiratory failure or pneumonia after testing positive. Airfinity, a UK-based health analytics company, estimates new cases to be around 3 million a day and close to 20,000 deaths every day. It estimates China has had over 44 million cases since December 1st. They say China likely saw its first peak of new infections last week, with around 3.7 million cases in one day. The company expects daily deaths to reach 25,000 in the coming weeks. Airfinity says it bases its estimates on data from China's regional provinces before the recent changes to China's reporting system. The analytics company combines this data with case growth rates from countries with strict lockdown measures like Hong Kong and Japan when they first lifted restrictions. A second peak is expected in early March, with daily cases predicted to climb to 4.2 million a day. A study by Peking University found some 900 million people in China have been infected. That would mean 64 percent of the country's population have carried or are carrying the virus. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. A health official in China's central Henan region says nearly 90 percent of the population there has had COVID. The upcoming Lunar New Year is expected to add to the spread. Many people travel to visit family during the holiday. And a prominent cardiologist is calling for the suspension of the mRNA COVID vaccination due to fears of cardiac harm. Professor Al Abdul Ghader is the president of the International Congress for Advanced Cardiac Sciences. He's also the founder of the Prince Sultan Cardiac Center in Saudi Arabia. He is joined by British cardiologist Dr. Asim Malhatra, who made the same appeal on BBC. The COVID mRNA vaccines do carry a cardiovascular risk. And um, I've actually called for the suspension of this pending an inquiry because there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment about what's causing the excess deaths. In uh, view of the cardiovascular complications of this type of vaccination, I think this type of vaccine should be suspended until it is fully investigated. Dr. Malhatra also mentioned the case of his father, who suffered a cardiac arrest at home. The cardiologist said he conducted research on his father's postmortem. He says the data indicated that the likely cause of de- his death were the two shots of the Pfizer mRNA vaccine. He published his findings in a peer-reviewed journal. He also states that post-COVID vaccination myocarditis is 28 times more common than post-COVID myocarditis. That data is based on a massive Nordic study of 23 million people published in JAMA Cardiology. 
House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer promises swift congressional oversight. This after the White House revealed that additional pages of classified documents had been found at President Biden's home in Delaware. Entity's Daniel Monahan brings us more. White House lawyer Richard Sauber announced on Saturday that five more pages with classified markings were found in Biden's Wilmington residence. Representative James Comer responded. What we see with President Biden is there are multiple locations. Uh, we would never have known about the possession of the classified documents were it not for investigative reporting. He is calling for fair treatment with respect to how both former President Trump and current President Biden are being treated with the document issue. Congressman Jamie Raskin concurs with his colleague across the aisle. So when my friend Mr. Comer says we're just looking for equal treatment, that's all we're looking for. Raskin says the special counsels for Trump and Biden are both trustworthy lawyers whom he thinks will get to the bottom of things. Senator Ted Cruz points out on verdict that the Biden team knew about the first document six days before the midterm elections. They hid it from the American people. <laughs> While White House Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre believes the Biden team has responded accordingly. We have been transparent in the last couple of days. In, remember, there's an ongoing process, and we have spoken when it is appropriate. The potential mishandling of classified documents is under investigation by special counsel Robert Herr. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Herr. Some Republican lawmakers are taking aim at the Department of Justice. Representative Ashley Hinson of Iowa wrote on Twitter, quote, more classified documents found in President Biden's home, yet still no FBI raid. The double standard is apparent. While Congresswoman Mary Miller wrote, where is the FBI? Two systems of justice. However, Senator Chris Coons thinks the whole affair is overblown. I think the differences between uh, what the former president did in terms of how he handled documents, how he responded to requests to return them, um, and how he has um, interacted with the Department of Justice and President Biden it is night and day. FBI agents raided Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort in Florida in August 2022, seizing around 100 documents marked classified or top secret. However, Trump says he declassified the materials when he left office. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Rescue hopes are fading after one of the Ukraine war's deadliest strikes against civilians. Dozens of people have now been confirmed dead from Saturday's Russian strike on the Ukrainian city of Dnipro. Dozens are feared to be still trapped under the rubble, while freezing temperatures added to the rescuers' concerns. Russia fired two waves of missiles at Ukraine on Saturday, striking targets across the country. The attack on this apartment block in the east-central city of Dnipro was one of the worst strikes against civilians so far in the war. It was struck by a Soviet-era KH-22 missile. The missile is known to be inaccurate, and Ukraine lacks the air defenses to shoot it down. Meanwhile, Russia and Belarus will begin what they're calling defensive air force drills today, triggering fears of a new ground offensive in Ukraine. Italy's most wanted man has been arrested. Police released a video of mafia boss Matteo Messina Denaro. It followed his arrest in a private hospital in Palermo. Messina Denaro had been on the run for three decades. Prosecutors say he is a boss of Sicily's Cosa Nostra Mafia. He was sentenced to a life term in absentia for his role in the 1992 murders of anti-mafia prosecutors Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino. He also faces a life sentence for his role in bomb attacks in Florence, Rome and Milan a year later, which killed 10 people. And after the break, we hear from the nephew of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He says today should be a day of service. Good to have you back with us. Today is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. President Biden marked the late Reverend's birthday by visiting Georgia yesterday. He spoke at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. Martin Luther King Jr. was a co-pastor there. I believe Dr. King's life and legacy show us the way we should pay attention. I really do. God bless Dr. Martin Luther King and his family. And based on his, one of his favorite hymns, precious Lord, take my hand through the storm, through the night, and lead me on to the light. 
May God bless you all, and let's go find the light. Biden said his message was choosing democracy over autocracy. He says the civil rights icon's past actions are a guide to the nation's future. Reverend and Senator Raphael Warnock invited Biden to speak at the church. He is the first sitting president to deliver a Sunday morning sermon at King's Church. And we also want to hear from the nephew of Martin Luther King Jr. I spoke to Isaac Newton Ferris Jr. who told us about his memories about his late uncle, but also about how we should remember him on this day. Take a listen. We should remember Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or Uncle Emil, as I used to refer to him as, as the most important individual in the 20th century that fought for the equal rights and equal treatment of all people regardless of what country they lived in, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of the God they worshiped or did not worship, regardless of their sexual orientation, regardless of their political beliefs, and regardless of their economic class. Uncle Emil truly believed and lived a life dedicated to the proposition that all human beings are children of God. And so therefore, all human beings are responsible to each other and all human beings are responsible for each other. The, the legacy that Uncle Emil left behind without a shadow of a doubt was a legacy of nonviolent change. He taught America and the world how to achieve the change that they sought, be it economic, social, uh, or political. He taught them how to achieve those changing changes using nonviolent means, the nonviolent tools of nonviolent protest demonstrations and nonviolent dialogue. Mm, and what do you think about nowadays? How do you view his wishes and teachings for today? How relevant are they now? I view the nonviolent philosophy of Uncle Emil as just what the doctor has ordered not only for America, but for the world. When you look across the world and you see where Russia has invaded the Ukraine, uh, when you look here in this country and witness the uh, words of violence and, and, and even acts sometimes of violence that uh, between Democrats and Republicans, you know how, vi how, how, how much the philosophy of, of Uncle Emil uh, is needed today and how it could impact the world and America today. Democrats and Republicans would still disagree, but they would disagree using, non, mean, uh, using acts of nonviolence instead of acts of violence. Violence is not only attacking someone. Violence can be expressed in the words that we use. And now, on a person, more personal level, what was the biggest impression you had of him back then as a kid, as an uncle? The, the, the memory I had of, the memories I have of Uncle Emil as a child can best be lovingly described as him being the crazy uncle. Um, as a child, I didn't understand why he did things a little different than the other adults in the family. For instance, uh, every year on Thanksgiving, the entire King family gathered at my immediate family's home. Um, Uncle Emil was always the last one to get there, which meant he was always late. He was always the first one to leave. And most times w when he got there, he would need to take a nap. And so therefore he would use my room to do so. Um, this was quite odd for me because I didn't understand that it was Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who was coming off the road from, from the work that he was doing. And it was Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who needed to get back out on the road to continue that work. Uh, but my fondest memories of, of him are of him being a practical joker. Uh, he used to like to play jokes on people and he used to like to tell jokes to people. And how do you want to continue his legacy now? As, you, as, as we celebrate the King holiday today, many people might not be aware that in 1996, 10 years after the holiday had been in existence, my aunt Coretta Scott King returned to the Congress and asked that 
the uh, holiday, the designation be changed uh, for the holiday. Instead of it just being a day to commemorate the life of my uncle, my aunt, my aunt asked the Congress and the Senate to officially designate the King holiday as a day of service. We encourage um, every, everyone to do anything that benefits someone else, no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how complex, no matter how simple. The point is, is that you're doing something that benefits someone else. And that is the best way to pay homage, respect, um, and love for the legacy and life of Martin Luther King Jr. If he were alive today, he would be the first one to say to everybody, look, I I'm flattered, but please don't sit around and talk about how good I was. If you really want to honor me, get out and do something that helps someone else. By doing that, every time you commit an act that benefits someone else and not yourself, it touches your heart and your mind. And the more that you do that, your heart and your mind become more open to living every day. And coming up, Shen Yun Performing Arts returns to UC Berkeley in California. Hear what audience members had to say about the world's premier classical dance company. Welcome back. The top classical Chinese dance company Shen Yun returned to UC Berkeley to perform over the weekend. The audience shared about the performance's display of culture, artistry, and goodness. And today's David Lamb reports. For this year, Shen Yun Performing Arts has five shows at UC Berkeley. Now at the Zellerbach Hall, we spoke to some audience members who are actually alumni of the school and they were touched by the performance. They were sharing about the meaning of history and culture after watching Shen Yun. It was just, I mean, so well done and so well put together. The time and the effort was so palpable. Um, it was just touching, like deeply to my soul and my core. And yeah, really inspiring. And seeing the amount of training and the repetitive, uh, you know, action that you have to take to learn all these moves and just to be able to do the splits like that, it, it's, we know how much work is going into it. I mean, just based on what we've seen, it's, it's really impressive. UC Berkeley alumni Sarah and Matt Adler saw Shen Yun for the first time over the weekend with a display of classical Chinese dance, music, and innovation. I like the orchestra. I like the narration. Um, the dancing is impeccable. I like the, uh, the multimedia effect, uh, the dancers jumping into the screen and off into the video. That was well done. Most of the artists practice Falun Gong, a Buddhist-based meditation system currently being persecuted under China's communist regime. The artists aim to show what China was like before the communist government tried to eradicate spirituality and faith. There's more to the culture than people see nowadays, I think. so. What I think is interesting is how much Marxism and communism have changed China, um, more than a lot of people realize, and that there's a, there's a difference to China now than there probably was then. And I think people don't uh, um, evaluate how important Marx, how, how much Marxism has changed China away from its traditional cultural roots. We live at a time that it's really almost the crossroads between good and evil. Which way are we going to go? And they clearly saw the time of renewal in the world where people believe in God, believe in goodness, believe in spirituality, and they, and they showed it in their dance and, and in the images on the screen. So it is, it is a time where we're all waiting for a Messiah to come or the true man to come to teach us truth, beauty, and goodness. So they hit on a very important theme. Shen Yun's mission is to share China's 5,000 years of history to the world. 
We need it more than ever right now, especially post-pandemic and with everyone being separated on lockdown. It's been really important to bring people back together and to remember our legacies and our stories and our history pre-pandemic. Um, I feel like it's really unifying humanity again and bringing people out of their homes and back into community so that we can remember where we came from and where we're headed and why we're here as human beings, just to celebrate life and celebrate beauty. Some of Shen Yun's upcoming West Coast performances are in Folsom, Fresno, Modesto, and Colorado in January, and Sacramento in February. Reporting in Berkeley, California, David Lamb, NTD News. You know, I think it's actually pretty nice that it seems like people can actually tell apart now, you know, the Chinese people from the regime. They're two separate things. Oh, yes. That is very important. And I really like how the show brings back traditional values. Absolutely. And it, it seems like, you know, it uplifts people, which is great nowadays. Yeah, so, based on what they were saying. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's it for today. Write us at goodmorning at NTD.com. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan.